Welcome to the Human Design Collective Podcast, where we explore this system as a unique map of our potential, from the mundane to the mystical. Peter Schober is a longtime human design teacher, author, and practitioner who's been radically dedicated to his personal process and prolific in his professional work with the system. His approach is deeply grounded, direct, and practical. He's been an analyst since 1993 and currently directs analyst and teacher training in Germany and Switzerland. His first book, The Centers, is one of our favorites for learning about human design and an excellent resource for anyone interested in the system at any level. From his first meeting with Ra Uruhu, the founder of the system, to the development of his own unique style of working with students and clients, to his perspective on the current state of the world, Peter shares a rare quality of emotional presence that feels uncomplicated by the mind, and the purity of his response is truly palpable. We open the episode with Peter sharing the basic elements of his human design body graph. May I just tell you before we start the basics of my design. I am a 3-5 emotional generator with the 58-18, the 39-55, the 37-40, and the 46-29 split off. And a totally open throat. And I have a left body and a left mind, and I'm active in the environment. So how, how did I met human design? Well, there are two answers to that. Uh, around the time when it came to me, I had a bookstore in Vienna. And its bookstore was specialized in, well, in esoterics and therapy, basically. So self-development and new age stuff. And I had been, I had some background. I had been roughly for 10 years the disciple of a shaman. So I was kind of aware that the world is not as it looks like. On the other hand, well, I was always interested in books and I loved books. I have an open mind. So, of course, I wanted to read everything. And um, creating a bookstore was like the final dream of my open mind. Mm. So nevertheless, of course, I had uh, the possibility to learn to know many interesting people. And of course, I read many books. And I lived at the end. It was clear to me that between certain elements of traditional esoterics and, and magic, there must be connections. So if you look, for example, at the Kabbalah and astrology, astrology, it is clear that there must be a connection and that an attempt to bring that together can be found in the Tarot. So for some time, I was very, let's say, in a very engaged way, I was studying Tarot. And um, then I published a book about Tarot. And at that time, I lived in a very beautiful place in Vienna which I actually could not afford, but life had provided it somehow. And the, the guy who was running the whole thing, he, is, he was born in Vienna and emigrated at the beginning of the, before the, immediately before the World War II, he immigrated to the States and was brought up there and later came back. He was a very, he was, let's say, a known man. He made movies and and very, very nice and educated and wise man. And he had, of course, a lot of connections to the States. So we had from time to time, we had interesting visitors. Well, and one day the visitor was Ra. And uh, that house, we lived in a huge house, but only three people. And we were almost like, we were very close friends. So what was going on in the one part of the house what was, what was definitely not hidden in the other one. So it was kind of inevitably that I would meet Ra. And of course, but at that time, the first thing you heard about human design was that it is a synthesis, a synthesis of chakra, astrology, physics. It was exactly what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, could not figure out. So I was, of course, interested. So I got a reading and the situation was not really super. I mean, Ra was very tired. It was his eighth reading. And at that time, a reading was very short. It was maybe 45 minutes. There were no types. There were no profile. It was very elementary. You cannot compare that to what we have today. I, with all my four models defined and no connection to the throat, I had always tried to be a manifestor. 
and I had worked like a maniac, and of course it didn't work. I knew that I was not stupid, but it didn't work. And if it worked, it was just enough, let's say, to get rid of the last catastrophe. Hmm. I was hoping that during that reading, he would tell me basically, you know, you are the perfect manifesto, but here you have made a little mistake. If you correct it, everything will be fine. And then the guy told me that I'm not a doer and that I should wait. I mean, I'm a 39.55. Waiting was not my strong side. So <laughs> I almost I would life like to spit on him. It was the last thing I wanted to hear. And because I had such a, such a strong response, it was clear to me, oh boy, there is something to it. And basically when I started my deconditioning process, it was just two things. I stopped initiating and I did not decide in a fast way anymore, not more than that. And when I was, uh, well, when I got in touch with some knowledge that looked interesting, I was always very determined. And so next year I met analyst education and well, and started with it. So this was early in human design. So is this in like the early 90s, late 80s that you're... Oh, yes, this was, that was 1992. Mm -hmm. And so you had this, it's something that we've heard people talk about a lot. And I think that we both see a lot where in a first reading, there's that experience of some kind of recognition of the truth, but also some kind of irritation or resistance to the facts. Yes, the yes, yes. I think that is, I'm not an exception. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you immediately move into studying human design? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. At that time, the only the black book existed with the line text. Mm -hmm. And then the, what I was offering an analyst education in Germany the next year. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah, the, the analyst education were eight days from eight o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock in the evening. On day nine, there was an examination and that was it. It was the it was wild the, the, the wild west the wild east how you want to call it but of course it was not you cannot compare it to today. So, like you mentioned, that that initial reading that you had is very different than the way things have developed today. What was it like to go through and witness the process of the development of the system as all of these terms and the format and the structure of how it's taught? What was it like to see that all develop as it was happening, to have the, you know, the types come in and the authorities and all of that? Yeah, it was like the, the unfolding, the unfolding, you can call it the unfolding of, of the formula. I mean, what I got, in my opinion, is the formula. His brain has been made to become the formula, but he did not have all the details himself either. He also had to investigate the formula and he unfolded it year after year. Mm -hmm. So I would describe what I have observed in the end. Mm -hmm. We both really love your center's book. I think it's one of the best primers for anyone just coming into human design. We recommend it all the time. But I also found it as a practitioner to be really, really helpful in terms of doing ongoing work with people or interactive mm -hmm. work mm -hmm. with people. Because you see mm -hmm. some people give a reading and they just sort of disseminate the information and walk away. But for John and I as projectors, we tend to find ourselves working with people in an ongoing way. And your book was really mm -hmm. helpful for that. Mm -hmm. And then at some point we came across a recording of you doing a demo with someone at some, maybe at an Ibiza event or something. Mm -hmm. My experience of it was the way you worked with, you were working with a generator and the way you did it was so simple and so direct and seemed to get right to the heart of the not self and of the nature. And I, I'm curious about, it reminded me of when I've seen a really, really skilled, masterful therapist do a demo with a client. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering about how you developed your way of working with people because it's very interactive, which is kind of unusual, I think, in the way most people are using human design. Well, actually it started from a practical point of view, of course. <laughs> uh, when I started to give living designs in Vienna, 
Um, at that time, the idea was you make two years, uh, two years, two days living design, and then a third day, is, let's say, six weeks later. And the third day, six weeks later, never really worked. So I decided I give a three-day living design, but I do offer people, let's say, an exercising day, one in spring and one in autumn for free. Mm-hmm. So it created a very good package. And when they came for these, um, for these uh, days, then of course they had practical questions out of their life. Because they once they came, they had at least tried somehow to apply their strategy, authority, whatever. And this helped me to learn a lot about how that formula turns out in life. Because in the beginning, it was really more a formula than, than something that was backed up by actual experience. And later, it turned out that I taught not only in Vienna, I taught in other cities, and I taught in Germany, and I taught in Switzerland. And then it was obvious that I can only give a three days, three day living design. I will not go a second time to another country for one day. So I established kind of that format for me. And for me, that individual work was always, especially in living design, where everything started, totally important. Because the point is not only that you understand, the point is that you feel it in the body. If you cannot connect the understanding with what you experience in the body, it is extremely difficult. I mean, we all know, and you, your clients will also have told you, that 50% of all generators have no idea how a sacral response feels, or to recognize the not-self patterns. Yes, okay, you have an open spleen, you may be dependent from whatever, but I mean, the mind is so good in disguising and explaining and justifying, and this you can only cut through in a dialogue. And, and, and additionally, of course, if I had make the work with one participant, everybody else will profit from that as well. It is literally, it is a part of the, of the whole thing. And this I like most. This is what I call for myself transformational work. My son is in the quota of mutation, so I am mutation and mutation and mutation. And this is the most satisfying part. And at the same time, as you have very well described, it is a little bit my brand. It is what makes me different. So I'm wondering if you can tell us about what the process was like for you as a generator and as an emotional generator coming to terms with that sacral response. How was that recognition? How did that develop for you personally? Slowly. I mean, obviously I'm slow. And... Um, as I said, right, I started with not initiating and taking my time in decision making, and that did not change my life within a week. But the resistance was gone. That is, that was the magic. The resistance was gone. Just slow down. Uh, you know, before when I drove to my to my bookstore, I would start from home and tell to myself, not later than in twenty five minutes. And then I just had a, a row of resistance till I finally arrived and didn't find a parking place. And then I said, not earlier than 25 minutes. And all of a sudden I was there in 23 without any, any, with, without any resistance. No? So that was very small, but very impressing. It was very impressing. No, yeah, and then, I, of course, I applied it. I'm a very practical person. I'm a 3-5. So I, apply, I applied it wherever I had an idea how I could. So in my private life and uh, also in my, in my professional life. When the first teacher training took place in Ibiza in 1995, several people were there. Everybody, of course, very excited. And there were, I think, three people from Austria. So, okay, we come back. Everybody's very excited they all announce a seminar and of course I have to cancel that. At that time, I was already, how shall I say, aware enough to say, I will not initiate the thing. Mm -hmm. I wait a little bit. And then maybe three months later, one of my very good clients, almost a friend came came to me in the bookstore and said, didn't you make the teacher teacher training about human design? Wouldn't you like to make a seminar one day? 
And I said, okay, guy, get your agenda, I get mine. And in my first seminar, I had 12 participants. This is uh, not only that it worked, but of course, it is also very convincing that it works. And so in steps like that, slowly but surely, it's developed. One of the things that really stood out for me in the, in the center's book, Peter, was how you would take what could seem like really abstract concepts for people you know, in human design and then use everyday language to relate it to their personal experience. An example I think you just used was, mm -hmm. you know, being slow rather than fast, for example, if, if you have emotional definition, people running around trying to go faster or maybe open route going faster, but to put it into simple terms that we can all experience, being able to take it from the head and then relate to it in the body in some way. That seems mm -hmm. but very powerful when the person can have that experience. Yeah, exactly. The moment the blending between understanding and, and feeling is there, then it gets alive. Yeah. Otherwise, it just stays in the head as an interesting system or curiosity, it seems. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes, yes. It is still good enough that you can sell it, but it does not have the impact you want. Yeah. I'm wondering if you can tell us more about the emotional process or the emotional experience. We've been talking a lot about the difference between emotional awareness and emotional energy. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I have a completely open emotional center. Um, mm -hmm. So it's something I study or look at. When I first started investigating it, I thought, well, maybe the emotional energy and the emotional intensity that emotional people feel is part of their process of coming to awareness or truth. And then the more I sat with it and studied people, I started to see that it seemed that the emotional intensity and the emotional energy was actually interfering with the awareness and truth. Like it was almost more about waiting for the emotional energy to settle and then you could see something. So I'm wondering, I don't know if you see it that way, but I'm curious about how you see the awareness and the energy play out in the emotional center. The difficulty of course is the power of the wave mm -hmm. because this is, a, this is a moment where everybody easily gets overwhelmed by the energy and the quality of the energy. Because if it is pleasure, you want to be in the pleasure. And if it's pain, you want to get rid of the pain. And in both cases, you are not aware. Uh, and this is the challenge, actually. Right? The challenge is, even if the wave is there, that you are still aware of what's going on. Um, and sometimes I have to say I'm not interested in that. Sometimes I just want to have the joy or the pleasure, you know? I mean, very plain. I don't care about the awareness then. <laughs> but principally, what has developed is, of course, because if you follow that way so long, there is a development of awareness taking place, of course, not only for others, but also for yourself. And I, what I do experience is the solar plex being a tool, really a tool of recognizing something. So there is, uh, the, you know, the wave is not always so strong. I mean, it's not always that you are totally euphoric or totally desperate. But there are many, many different states. And often if I have a response, the response is accompanied by a kind of feeling uh, that is very trustworthy for me, which does not mean if I have to make a bigger decision, of course I wait, mm. but it turns out that in many, 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 many cases, that first feeling I have was very, very accurate. But this is nothing I would say a beginner, mm. because they would think they would not need to wait. That is more the, I, I think it is, what in, in later stages comes is a resonance, a resonate to the things that are correct for you. Um, and that makes, well, generally speaking, it makes it easier to find the, the right people, they find the right things, it is you automatically drawn to what is good for you. And at the same time, my, the strengths of my emotions have not changed, 
but I can say they do not rule me in that sense. So if I give in, as I said before, sometimes I want to just have my pleasure, then it is another conscious decision. It is not overruling me. You have 39.55. So there's not only the intensity of pain at times, but also the melancholy that can go with it or the individuality that goes with that. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that now? Or how did, how did that develop for you, the, the process of going through the low part of the wave? I have to say that most of the time I'm working. And when I work, I'm always in a good mood. Hmm. I'm never really in a bad mood when I work. It can be that after um, one minute after I finished, there may be something different. But working is something that brings me a lot of stability, even on the emotional level. And the other thing is that, of course, if you want to have the joy, you also need to accept the pain. That is, the 55 is a very, very mystical gate in my understanding. And there is a step. Normally, you want to have good feelings and you do, and you want to avoid bad feelings, generally speaking. But there is a stage where you are just interested in the intensity. Hmm. I do not care so much about what side of the wave it is, it's, but I like it to be strong. That's, that's what I would say. I like the intensity of the emotional field. Mm-hmm. And additionally, of course, this looking for the abundance leads you to many interesting experiences. And as I'm, I'm as I'm a C5, you know, for me, it's everything just an experience. I do not have any holy cows, you know, it is just an experience. I've never heard anyone say it the way you did, but it's very interesting to me what you're talking about as an emotional being that over time, and perhaps what you're saying is, once you come into your own frequency or once you have a strong sense of your own frequency that you can recognize what resonates perhaps more quickly than at the start. That is nothing for the first seven years. (laughs) Just an observation. It's just an observation. I understand. So I'm wondering now in your work, What's the focus of how you work with people now? Are you mostly teaching? Are you mostly doing readings? Or is there a particular aspect of the work that's more your focus? Well, there, I would say there are two big fields. One field is teaching. I have, it depends. It is, it, 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 there is a certain variation, but I, I, I may have between 70 and 100 teaching days a year. I teach mainly, of course, in the German-speaking countries, in the Russian Federation and in Italy. Um, but I also have been to Ukraine and Kazakhstan. And so, but this, these were like excursions. But Italy and Russian Federation, this is a, a regular, ongoing, ongoing um, story. And this is very precious for me. I, I liked it very much. And it is, uh, it, is, it is at the core of my work. And then I, we, I have together with, uh, with uh, um, a technical partner in Switzerland, um, we have a company there, and we have specialized on two things. Uh, we translate um, we translate many things from Ra to German and publish them as books, as printed books, uh, but only um, only independent. So we do not pay, we do we do not deliver to bookstores and we do not sell it via Amazon. We sell it ourselves. Mm-hmm. So that is a little bit more expensive, but it is it is solid. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are not dependent from from anybody. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is we have created what I call collective products. I need to explain. I know. The problem is a good reading. A good reading is expensive. Usually, I mean, I don't know how it is in the US. And of course, I'm a little bit more expensive than others. But even if you are more or less a beginner, it will cost you 200 euros. For some people, it is like creating the resistance that the first step is more difficult through that. And we have created in the meantime, several products 
they are, we could call out automated readings. But you have to see this is not, this is, this is no scrap. That is, I have an, an, a beginner's reading that contains the analysis of the center configuration and type strategy authority. I have built up the audios over 10 years. So these are following the center configurations. These are almost 2000 different analysis and additionally differentiated by gender. That makes a, a very good product, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sell that for 59 euros mm -hmm. and we sell thousands of them. And this brings new people to design. Mm -hmm. uh, before we did that, there was a kind of, there is a small group in, you, in human design. They are very deep in it and they study this and they study that. But it is not growing so much. I mean, it, talking about new people, you know, really new people. And with this relatively cheap product, I mean, we have a, we have a whole range now, right? We have a profile reading, we have a PHS reading. There is a whole range now. Mm -hmm. We have, the, of course, the PG5, PG5 report from Linda, the HD report from Linda. But I am specializing, this is all spoken, it is not written. These are true readings. These are true readings. And this is the second thing because I consider that to be very important. I mean, we are in the last seven year cycle before 2027. And if we go up, go on in that speed we have now, then we have, how shall I say, we have not fulfilled the job. And are these in German? In German language. Yeah, yeah, that is German language. Yes. Are they in yes. English also? No, not, not no. so far. I'm very open to that, but it would be an additional very, very big effort to start something like that. Because that is a lot of work. I really know what I'm talking about. It's a lot of work. Sure. Um, and the other thing is, of course, well, yes, I can speak English, but if I'm the right speaker for an American or British community, is at least an open question. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have my, let's say, my my funny sides and my <laughs> weak spots in my English. And if you have a talk like that, it's no problem. But it, if it is like a professional product. I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. I wanted to go back to something you just touched on uh, a moment ago. You said that at the current rate that we're moving in terms of, you know, human design reaching new people, we're not going to make it by 2027. Could you say a little bit more about that? Like what your perspective is there? Well, I mean, on the one hand, of course, it's speculation. I mean, a prophecy is very nice, but a prophecy you cannot prove. And the future is always a little bit insecure. But looking in the world right now, I mean, in March of this year, the last seven year cycle started till the first Reef child will be born, according to the prophecy. So it is more or less, it is a confirmation. And if you look into the world, there are so many problems that it cannot go on as it has been is very, very clear. In one way or the other, this, the whole thing will explode. And human design for us, human design was a privilege. It allows us to live a life that is, let's say, let's say not free from resistance, but much, much easier than it was before. Uh, it brings us the fulfillment of our signature and it is a ne never ending interesting that you can spend a long life visit and you will never get bored. That is a privilege. But if what Ra said is even half true, then human design will be the key for survival. And this is something else. And after 2027, we will not teach PTL programs to go over four years, very likely. Uh, I expect that we have very many fast classes telling people their strategy and authority. <laughs> Uh, because that is, this is like, uh, you know, it is like examination in war times, you know? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but we did not, I mean, human design has spread around. I agree. It has spread around, but mostly as you have said, as something very interesting. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm afraid that if we could compare the number of people who know from human design and the number of people who at least try to follow the strategy authority, there would be a very big gap. 
well, if we can help to to close that a little bit, I would be very happy. I, I'm very collective. No? I have both my sons are closing the 5018. So my light shines in the correction of the collective. Oh, wow. And when you look out into the world right now with the, the current world situation, the coronavirus, everything that's going on, one of the things that, that I see is that it's becoming more difficult for anyone to get clear on the facts, for example, or to know, you know, who to listen to, where where the accurate data is coming from. And for me, all of that points back to what you're saying, which is that that uh, relationship that we have with external authority is beginning to either, you could say, come into question or breaking down. And so human design with inner authority, strategy and authority, offers a an, another possibility, you know, and maybe the possibility. The only, the only possibility. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, Corona is a perfect preparation and at the same time, a perfect metaphor. Uh, because if you look, nobody knows. Yeah. It is totally obvious that nobody really knows. And that is a fact. That means in the end, people will have to find out that nobody can know by mind. The great mutation that 61 is supposed to bring is the knowing that the mind cannot really know. So that is at least what I hope for. <laughs> um, that would be the great mutation, not just another knowing. We have so many kinds of knowing and none of them works or is sure, secure. But to understand that mind cannot know, but your body can, that would be annoying. Yeah. Yeah. I think I heard you say that in some of these recorded readings that you've amassed, that you have them differentiated for by gender? Yes. For men and women, is that right? Can you say more about the reasoning behind that or what, what that does? Well, that if you address somebody, you cannot ignore uh, the specific conditioning. And in each society, um, being a man or being a woman leads to a different conditioning in 99% of all cases. And that is enough to make a sense for differentiation. And the other thing is, of course, I want to create products that are as differentiated as possible. So I have made a profile reading uh, where the differentiation is not only the profile, uh, but it is also it is the gender, it is the age group, it is the type, and the differentiation by authority. So these are 968 variations. Um, and these are then the products, they are very, very successful. And most beautifully, nobody can compete with that. <laughs> I mean, I have my ego, I am competing, I want to be the best one. And uh, therefore, I'm a, and a perfectionist, of course, so I do my best. <laughs> so it sounds perfect, perfect for you. Maybe you could say more for us then if we take that a little further about what are some of the, the differences that you see for men and women in terms of being a generator, for example? Yeah, it depends. Of course, it, it depends very much from the generation and the country. Mm -hmm. So the traditional gender difference, I mean, I say the man brings the money, the woman cares for the children, uh, is of course in the reality of modern societies very often not true. But it is still existing in the heads. And mm -hmm. this is one of the problems. Right? It, it, the same is true with relationships. Right? If people think they are staying together all their life, it is just fantasy. But it is in our heads because this is the cliche, it is the... Um, the fairy tale that has been told to, to all of us. And then you compare your own life with that and you suffer unnecessarily. Talking about the gender difference, yes. For example, there are, we, we all have uh, in design, you also can identify more quote-unquote male and more quote-unquote female qualities. And okay, if you are a man and you have your male qualities, everything is fine. But how do you deal if you are, well, if you have softer qualities? And the same on the other, on the other side, right? If the 
uh, a woman can also have a 51, 25, or a 38, 28, or something like that. And uh, but it makes a difference. It makes a difference in, in the uh, regarding how the outside will respond to that, mm -hmm. and what you may think about it. It brings to mind being a female manifester versus a male manifester, and how different the conditioning could be across the genders. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. The male would be encouraged to be more, to initiate more, or to be more aggressive, or, and the female yes, would be yes, suppressed, yes. or like, no, you can't do that. That's not how it works. You know, they, they just, or they are afraid to be seen as a bitch or something like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. I see that often with a sacral generator women, especially single definition sacral generator women. There can be such a decisiveness when they're connected to their response mm -hmm. that it goes against so much gender conditioning around being compliant, negotiating, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. open yeah, to yeah, yeah. others. And it's, uh, it does seem very strong. So it's exciting to hear that you've done it that way because it seems like a very important thing to address. Yeah. A differentiation means that we, as far as possible, relate to the differentiation. And gender is definitely an important one. But the same is true for the age group. I mean, it makes a big difference if you are 25 or 55. Uh, not if, in that sense, if, they, if there is a possibility to, uh, to tailor what you have to say a little bit to this differentiation as well, it becomes more precise. Can you say a little bit more about that, about how you work differently with people based on where they are in the stage of life? Basically, if you understand the body graph in a comfortable way, you address people how they are supposed to be addressed. That is, of course, not so easy as I know. It's not as so easy as it, as it sounds. Together with somebody else, I made, um, in Moscow, I made a, what we call a living design experience. That is a longer living design where practical exercises are built in. And one exercise was the generators had to invite the projectors in a proper way. Not one generator was able to do that at first. <laughs> Not one. Um, on the other hand, I have to say that not many projectors were able to ask good questions. We, we all have something to learn about the other, about the other types. And again, in a practical way, it is one thing to understand projectors should be invited, but what does it mean? Yes, it is good to ask generators, but how exactly do you do that? Mm -hmm. It sounds so easy, but it is not easy. Is that something you could explain to us now? I'd like to pass that on to my, my family members. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Well, that is also a very important topic. I mean, many people live in an environment that is not interested in human design or even hostile. And what do you do? In my experience, it is, for example, I'm really not initiating that I can say never, never. And that means if you do not ask me, I will never, I will never tell about human design. You can be my friend for 20 years and you did not hear a word about it. Mm -hmm. But if you change, you change the system you are part of. There is nobody isolated. That is a part of our illusion that we are isolated. But truly, wherever you belong to, so to speak, if you change, the system change at least a little bit. And in the end, you, the, the only thing you can do is be true to yourself. Hmm. So, and of course, it is a great grace it is a great blessing if people around you are also in the process. It makes it much, much easier. No, no question. Can you say more about this projector generator relationship, the interaction between projectors and generators? No, yeah, I consider it then, how shall I say? Of course, the easiest relationship is always within your own type. That's the one thing. Um, but if we understand that the differentiation of types also must have some reason, <laughs> the ones who are, how shall I say, the ones who can profit mostly from each other are generators and projectors. Mm. I mean, for generators, it is not automatically, it is not natural for them 
to care about the use of their energy. It is like that. If I go to the supermarket or a bicycle or I ride the bike and let's say I forget forget something, I don't care. I like to move. And this is not a bad thing. But if you apply the same attitude to nuclear plants, it becomes a bad thing. And this is the challenge. This is the challenge. And therefore, so how shall I say that guiding of awareness, because in the end, it is the guiding of awareness. Uh, that is a great topic and a very necessary topic. No? Mm -hmm. The generators have gone wild. And now the, 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 the world is at the burnout stage. No? I mean, before, you know, manifestos were great. They brought new stuff and then they destroyed everything. In that way, there was a balance kept. Mm. Then the manifestos lost their influence and then you have the generators without their manifesto commanders and the generators do what they can do best, more. More of everything. And this is at the root of our problems. The more, the ongoing, the eternal more. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you're saying the correct role of projectors going forward in the world, especially as it relates to generators, is the guiding of awareness, that that's the emerging role that is needed. Absolutely. Everything follows awareness automatically. If you ever ask yourself, how can you guide the energy of somebody else? If you manage to guide the awareness. And this, of course, also needs an invitation, no question. It does not change the procedure. I mean, everything follows automatically awareness. What you are made aware of, you cannot overlook anymore. Mm -hmm. This is helping me see a, a funny thing about myself and my own interaction with generators. Mm -hmm. I think when I first discovered human design and I saw what's typically said is you're here to guide energy, but I can see that if I started to interact with generators and try to guide their energy, that didn't always work so well. I really appreciate the way you're saying it because you're talking about projectors guiding awareness so that a generator can guide their own energy or use their own energy. Yeah, if you think, I mean, projectors are here to ask questions and nothing guides awareness more than a question. If I ask you how, how's the weather in your place, you cannot help but to turn your awareness to that question. A question is an extremely powerful tool and no other type is designed to use it like you. And a question is not, a question does not so easily need resistance. But if you tell me what I should do, I can become very unfriendly. But if you ask me a question, I may have a response or not, but this is not, this is nothing what is kind of separating us. On that topic of asking generator questions, how would you describe the correct way to do it that you mentioned earlier? You said that most projectors in that workshop weren't <laughs> even really sure how to ask the correct question to a generator is, could you expand on that? Yeah, I think first of all, it is very important to make sure that it is okay. So even if you are let's say you have a friendship with somebody, you know, you know each other and it is, it is an easy and relaxed relationship. Before you ask one of these questions, in my opinion, you should ask if this is a good, if this is a good moment to do it. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, I have some projectors in my life. They have, we could say a standing invitation, but I can say sometimes I'm just not in the mood. And if it's just, if it's just coming without any, preparation, we could say, it is a little bit like, ugh, keep me in peace now. I'm, I'm just not ready for that. And of course, that is not really a rejection. And one more question will not harm. I'm moved to ask about the open throat. You have a completely open throat. Mm -hmm. And I heard you say something once about getting attention is not the same as being seen. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I yes, thought that was a very yes, powerful yes, yes. insight. Can you say more about it? Yeah. I mean, of course, for me, seeing, seeing, I mean, everybody likes to be seen. It is also a human thing. It's not only a type thing. But of course, for me, in the center, for me, is that what I do is satisfying for me. This is true. And um, that kind of work is 
very satisfying for me. So that is the foundation. And if somebody sees me, this is like, this is the sugar, the additional sugar on the, on the top. And well, with the open throat, I was never, in my case, I was not looking for attention, but I wanted to be a manifestor. So that was all with my four mothers, all this energy wants to do something and has no way, or let, at least no fixed way how to do. And this, in, in my, that was my personal trap. There are maybe things I have done also to get attention, how I behaved in a restaurant or something like that. That did not create any major problem for me. But trying to be a manifesto created a lot of problems. Well, and I was always good with language, actually. From the very early time in school, I language, I was very fascinated with language. But I did, it was not easy for me to speak about myself. So if it was about something, it was, in most cases, I do not remember any big problem. But in personal relationships, I had great difficulties expressing myself verbally. And then, of course, when I, I remember when I started to teach, I always, if there's somebody had communicating connection, I always asked them to sit in the first row. And it is, of course, conditioning can, can be a support. Mm -hmm. And now in the meantime, I have, I have done that so many times. I can speak endlessly and I do not have any problems with this role. But I will not speak if you don't ask me. Yeah, I can really feel your response in this dialogue. It's actually one of the, probably the better examples of a generator being very grounded in their response that I've come across. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's obvious to me. I was wondering if we could go back to something that we were talking about a little bit earlier, the differences in age. I've had a couple of situations, a handful of people show up having heard of human design uh, for a foundation reading who are in their, let's say their, their mid seventies, for example, mid to late seventies. And it feels to me that the approach that you take with a person at that stage of life would be quite different than the approach that you would take with someone who say was coming to you as a 20 year old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there are two things. It depends. We have extremely new bodies. We have these nine centered bodies and they are capable of many things we cannot yet really imagine. That means that, for example, especially in the US, there are many people in their mid seventies, they are not thinking of dying the next five years. They, they think of dying in 25 years. Mm -hmm if at all. <laughs> so for them, a reading still means to, to change something for the better in their life, in their actual life. On the other hand, of course, somebody who is, has that, that age, most people have their regrets. They have their regrets about what had, has happened in the past, the wrong decisions, the whatever, you know, whatever. And then for me, a reading also is a possibility to create peace with the past. So if they can see their mechanic, for example, they're not self-mechanic. And I mean, practically, if you do not have the knowledge, how are you supposed to come out of that? I mean, it is everywhere. It is normal. It is the easiest way to a certain degree, the easiest way to go. And still, of course, you feel that something is wrong. Something is wrong. And it leads, of course, to decisions that are definitely not the best. So that is also, human design is also sensing. It's, it's also not only understanding, it's also sensing. And that will become more important as we enter the time of great change. People will have a lot of sensing questions. Can you say more about this time of change that we're going through? If you have a sense of where we're headed or what we're going to need most? Corona is the beginning of the end. We have entered that seven year cycle of dissolution and it will go very fast. From next year on, it will go very, very fast. When Pluto enters the 60 and shortly after that, Neptune enters the 36, then you have a very strong limitation you cannot avoid leading to a crisis that dissolves. And this is what we can say the first chapter of the tragedy. Each good tragedy has at least three chapters. And this is, this was the prelude. What we have now, this is the prelude. It allows you to adjust 
to the fact that this that the times are really changing. And in my opinion, next year we it will open the first chapter. And I do actually I will do an, a seminar for the for the people in Moscow in in some days about 2027 the development of the world till 2027 in the mirror of the transit field. So therefore I'm really I'm just in the preparation of that with the, the slides the presentation. I mean it is the end of something very old and strong is not beautiful because none of these great systems, great, not in the sense of great, but powerful, will go peacefully. That will be dirty. That will get very dirty. Mm -hmm. Not everywhere at the same time, of course, there is a differentiation of time and places and so on. But generally, sometimes I think Ra died because he didn't want to see all of that. <laughs> I mean, he has the last note in the gate two, in the receptivity, and exactly when he turned in the last quarter of the novels, he died. So, in my opinion, avoiding the ugliness that would come. But that is just a hypothesis. Yeah. Well, and what we need is to trust ourselves. That is the only thing you need. You trust your body, you trust yourself, you trust your strategy, how you ever want to call it. But you do not trust anybody else. Not because everybody wants you bad, but how could somebody else know better than you. It is impossible. And I told you, and um, this is my deepest conviction, what the body is capable of, we did not even touch it. But it is evolving. It gets easier to tap into that. Things that may seem almost unbelievable today may be very normal in some years. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about in terms of healing or in terms of sensory perception when you're talking about what the body's capable of? No, first of all, the endurance, what the body can stand if treated in a correct way. Then, of course, the cognition, no question. If you have unfolded your cognition, that is really something that makes a difference and it gives you a pleasure, but not only, it's not only for pleasure, it also has a very practical, um, let's say, a reason. And this being attracted to the right things, this immediate feeling if something is wrong, that is, it is difficult to describe, but you navigate. The body can navigate difficult terrain in a very graceful way. And this is what we will need. I mean, think about surfers. We are expecting really big waves to come. But amongst the surfers, they are the ones, they enjoy the big waves. Yeah. They actually go looking for them. And we are supposed to surf the waves of destiny. Therefore, the big waves are not nothing to be afraid of. They are an opportunity and a challenge, of course. But if you are ready to take that on, they will bring us to our highest abilities. Because, you know, everybody is lazy. <laughs> if we don't must, we don't move. <laughs> well, it seems we're in the midst of a big must in terms of global events now like you said the the limitation and the things that we won't be able to avoid so it it seems like quite an impetus to pursue things we we might be too lazy to at, at other times also in that aspect just trust your body your body will tell you when you have to start something <laughs> and what and what it comes somehow it comes your way and and then you recognize it why is it so difficult for the mind to trust the body or to stand to step back and let the body take over? Is it momentum from the seven centered world or just the ongoing conditioning? No, well, the mind is the control freak. Um, the mind is usually the not self mind, and the not self mind is also afraid to die. Everything that lives wants to continue to live. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mind is the one who has to die in order to be reborn. And this is the moment where the mind hands over to the body. That is the moment where it, the, the not-self mind dies and can be reborn as something different. And yeah, there is a lot of fear to give up control. That is an illusion anyway, but nevertheless. I know that here, in, since you had mentioned this power of the body, that that we're still discovering. I know we're seeing a lot of people asking about primary health systems 
in mm-hmm. human design and it seems like more and more people are becoming aware that it exists and that it's part of the human design work. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you guide people in, in working with PHS? I didn't know anything about it for the first six years, really, that I was mm-hmm. working with human design, just working with strategy and authority. But now I see many people come in and they have some awareness or question about it immediately as soon as they're hearing mm-hmm. about it. So what's your guidance? The, the beautiful thing with PHS is you can do it right away if you want. I mean, we have the, the four steps in transformation. And the first two, you can start whenever you want. The second two have to come to you. Also, I mean, the right place, it's nothing you can just make. And the awakening of the mind is a long-term project, <laughs> to say the least. But you can, if you are ready, you can start your PHS. And of course, that is the foundation because all higher abilities depend from the awakening of the body. You cannot expect the mind to shine in its brightest light if the body is done. Therefore, after strategy and authority, this is truly the second step. And without that, there, there will be a great limitation to your process. You still can have a process that leads you somewhere and it is, you have a better life and all these things. But the body is limiting. I mean, all, cogni- all cognition abilities in the end come from the body. And also your life quality comes very strongly from the body. And it is a extreme tragedy how many people are sick unnecessarily. So PHS is really a very, very good thing. And it is actually, it is not so difficult in most cases to follow. There are exceptions, I know. But the ones who are ready will start it. And, but for you, it's definitely necessary. It would make a great difference. I'm now, now, now following my PHS since 15 years. It's also, it is a never-ending process, right? Like with strategy and authority itself, it is a never-ending process and uh, that alone is very beautiful. Peter, what is your determination? Um, I'm a second color, second tone. So open, open. you open, I'm closed. Yes. I was wondering. The old bodies, the old bodies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the funny thing about that second color determination for oh. me was before I even encountered PHS or started learning about it, I would find myself going back to the same things and just eating very uh, kind of a very limited, rigid diet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then yes, yes. it was explained to me, I, I did a PHS reading and that's what that is, you know? And I find that a lot of people or often people will have that experience of you'll, you'll be showing them something from the point of view of the system and it ends up being a validation or confirmation of something that they may have already been doing or noticing in themselves to whatever degree they were in tune with themselves mm-hmm. or their body. Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. That is also, that is very, it is a confirmation. It is like an ongoing confirmation that it really works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It sounds to me like you're saying the most important thing is that we reach as, as many people as we can so that we have the tools we need to weather the times that that we find ourselves in. Yeah, and yet, of course, the most important thing is that you do what is correct for you. So I I have to say, if I would not really like to do what I'm doing, I would do something else. Mm -hmm. So I'm not responsible for the world, please, no. Yeah, I mean, there is an open question if I ever can be responsible for myself, but let's say, that I can try, <laughs> but everything else is nothing for me. I mean, I can care about it, but it is definitely not my responsibility. But at the same time, I think human design, of course, has come into the world and it has reached specific people so far because there is something we have to do, each one in his or her way. And as I am, as I, as I, as I, so, as I, as I told you, as I am a collective person, of course, I think in these dimensions. It's a natural perspective for me. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Your frequency is very unique, yeah. as, as we all are, but as a human design teacher, it's, mm-hmm. it's really powerful. So thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure meeting you. So have a good time and uh, don't be afraid. Life is providing. That's okay. something we all need to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. You're very nice people.
Thank you for listening to the Human Design Collective podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please review us and share. For more information about us and to connect with others on this experimental journey, please visit us at humandesigncollective.com. You can also learn more by exploring our course and workshop offerings at courses.humandesigncollective.com. Music for the Human Design Collective podcast, courtesy of Role Model. For more information, see the show notes. And please stay tuned for more upcoming episodes on the same channel. 